Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Investment, Landscape, and Ag Tech panel. We're excited to be here today to talk about the changing landscape in ag technology, about the ecosystem, adjacent technologies that hit within ag tech, and we have an esteemed panel this morning that covers very early stage investing, angel, some later stage, as well as corporate investing, and we'll take a little bit of time to discuss what each of those means. I'm Nancy Sullivan. I am part of Illinois Ventures. We're the venture capital arm of the University of Illinois. We exist to help support technologies coming out of the university and our alumni, and we invest in complex R&D with a special focus lately in the ag tech space as we see it growing. Our board chair used to be the former president of Ralston Perina, so we have a lot of great, rich roots in the area. And I'm going to take a moment to allow our panelists each to introduce themselves and talk more about exactly what they do and how it fits into our investment in landscape and ag tech. So, Corbett. Hi. Hi, I'm uh, Corbett Cool. I'm uh, co-founder of uh, Tillable. Uh, Tillable is a uh, farmland uh, rental marketplace. Uh, we were started in 2018. Uh, I was also co-founder of uh, 640 Labs, uh, which was uh, acquired by uh, Climate Corporation in, uh, in 2014. Um, I've got a long history with the uh, University of Illinois. Uh, my father went to school here. I wasn't smart enough to get in, uh, but my son goes here, so uh, I'm writing checks to the university. So, uh, <laughs> Uh, super excited to be on the panel today and give you a uh, founder's perspective of the investment landscape. So thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Tim Foote. I'm with Flyover Capital. We're an early stage venture capital firm. As the name suggests, Flyover Capital, we invest in the central part of the United States, really anywhere outside of the traditional tech hubs, so San Francisco, New York, and Boston. Um, we're what you would call a, a generalist firm, so we're for the most part industry agnostic. Um, we've made 16 investments so far, and just the way it's worked out, there's really not been too much overlap in any of the industries there. Um, but one thing that we do try to consider is in the communities that we spend a lot of time uh, in, we try to look at what the natural resources of those communities are. And we're headquartered in Kansas City, though I'm located here in Champaign. Uh, so naturally, ag tech is one of those areas uh, of interest and where we do see some deal flow from. We've made uh, one investment in the ag tech space, which is a company that probably a lot of you here are familiar with, Agribol. We led their Series A uh, round. We do late seed and early Series A investments. Uh, good morning. My name is David Pearson, and I'm Managing Director for Venture Capital at Syngenta. Uh, so we are a corporate investor, so we're a little bit different from the rest of the crowd and hoping to have an opportunity this morning to um, shed some light on uh, how a corporation looks at supporting the entrepreneurial and the innovation sector. Um, Syngenta Ventures was founded in 2009, so we have been putting money into um, minority equity investments uh, for longer than most. Um, and we're proud, of, we're proud to have been a founder in the, in the early stage um, of ag tech. Uh, so I work with a group of eight people. Uh, we have a couple of people in uh, Basel, Switzerland, who look after investments in uh, Europe and the Middle East, primarily Israel, and we see really terrific um, technology coming out of Israel. Uh, we have one partner in London uh, who looks both ways at, at uh, Europe and investments in North America. And then in Research Triangle Park, where I'm located, uh, we have a couple of people uh, looking after uh, investment deal flow in North America, um, which includes myself. And then I also have responsibility for deal flow in Latin America. And then uh, we have one person in Minnetonka, Minnesota, uh, who also looks after deal flow in uh, North America. 
Um, we invest globally, so we have investments um, primarily in the U.S. and Europe. Uh, we have a portfolio of about 28 companies, roughly 50-50 between Europe and the U.S., although we have a few deals in Australia, New Zealand. We just made an investment in India. Um, I have two companies uh, in which I've invested in uh, Argentina and Brazil. We just approved a third investment in Brazil. Um, so we, we do have a very active global footprint, which um, means for a lot of air miles. Uh, we, um, we do early stage from seed, and we'll make an investment as small as maybe $250,000. But, but we cover the spectrum, right? So we'll do um, seed stage all the way through to growth equity and even private equity. So we'll partner with a private equity firm that would like Syngenta to be a minority participant in a change in control <laughs> transaction, for example. Um, I think our sweet spot is series A and B where we typically write a check for three to five million dollars. And uh, we'll either take a board seat or an observer seat. We usually negotiate that with the entrepreneur. Um, we don't have an ego about that. We feel we can be equally uh, influential or participative or value-adding, um, whichever. Um, we never ask for rights when we come into a deal. So a lot of corporate investors will show up and they'll say, um, we would like a right of first refusal, We're, we'd like a right of first negotiation, something like that. Um, we don't do that. We, we are designed to uh, behave just like a traditional uh, financial investor, right? And we find that plays very well with the entrepreneurial community. Um, so when we come in, we come in peri passu, and um, uh, my partners and I each have an average of, uh, so I've been in venture investing for 15 years now. And my partners and I, we have an average of, I think, 13 years experience across our group. So uh, as a CVC unit, we have more than the typical amount of investing experience. And uh, one of the things we really uh, try to do is to bring the expertise and our networks to play um, to, an, to, to a startup, right? We, we, we find that that brings a lot of value to the board in terms of um, networking for commercial opportunities within and outside of Syngenta, but also in accessing R&D expertise um, within and outside of Syngenta. So, um, it, AgTech has taken off in the last five years, so it's been an awful lot of fun. Um, and we're trying to do our best to, to support the innovation community. Great. Um, I'm Connie Bowen, and I am with the Yield, Yield Lab Institute, actually, and, and we'll also speak to the Yield Lab a bit. Um, so the Yield Lab uh, was the first AgTech accelerator uh, in the US. We started our first in class of investments was in 2015. Um, we're based in St. Louis, and so, uh, or started in St. Louis at least. I continue to be based in St. Louis. Um, and we invest in agri-food tech companies with an impact lens. Um, and so I'll, I'll speak to that in a moment. But um, I've been with the Yield Lab for three of our less than five years. Um, and over the past two and a half years or so, we've launched additional accelerators in Argentina, Ireland, and Singapore. Um, and, and all of those and all of our funds are similarly kind of, we don't have geographic restrictions when we look at our investments. We're really looking at everything in kind of a global context um, to, to understand, you know, how we can help our portfolio expand internationally as they grow. Um, so the way that our accelerator is set up, uh, we invest $100,000 in six to eight companies per year. Um, that's, that's our model. We, we don't do cookie cutter term sheets. I think you, you see a lot in kind of the, I guess, traditional accelerator, the Y Combinators, the Tech Excels, that sort of thing. Um, there tends to be a little bit more of a, uh, 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 because they're making very early stage investments, there's just a very clear set of terms that they put forth, which has pros and cons. Um, we find that 
because we're very specific to agriculture and because when we, when we started, at least, we were the, kind of the only thing in town for, for ag tech companies. Um, we actually end up with a variety of stages of, of deals. So, you know, we're, we're primarily seed investors. We're actually now, now that we've, since we've expanded, uh, we've now got the capacity to do some seed and A deals. Uh, but even though we're writing these small 100K checks on the accelerator funds, um, we find that we participate sometimes in later stage deals. Uh, our part of our kind of secret sauce, I guess, if you will, is, is really all of our general partners are coming out of agribusiness. Um, so we've got folks who understand the space. I think a lot of the times, um, it, it, another part of my background is managing some, some angel investors in New York doing more traditional tech investment. And I think you see a lot of traditional investors starting to invest in ag tech, but uh, they might not have the expertise to be able to guide. You know, we had that great panel before on kind of corporate relations. Uh, because all of our partners are coming out of that kind of corporate executive environment, we're really able to help our companies navigate those relationships and make sure they're getting introduced to the right person at the right level of that company um, and making sure they understand, okay, like here's, here's, don't talk to them until you have IP in hand and, and figuring out all of those kind of details. Um, so that's kind of our fun side. I did mention that when we make investments, we look at it through an impact lens. Uh, there are no quantitative metrics for the agri-food tech investment space right now. When you look in terms of sustainability, when you look in terms of uh, yeah, environmental and social impact. Um, and so this is something that when the yield up was started was very important to our core founders. We genuinely want ag tech to improve food systems. So in order to do that, you know, we can have all of these usual financial quantitative reporting metrics but we don't have that system yet for agriculture um, and for vent specifically for venture capital investments into, into technologies. And so we started the Yield Lab Institute, which I'm now managing. And, and through that, we're really focused on how do we develop the ecosystems and improve connectivity in the ag tech space to drive more investment in the space. And a key component of that is quantifying impact metrics in the space. Um, so that's, that's a, the quick kind of intro I'll give. Hi, I'm Kevin McKern. Um, I'm actually with Michigan State University, uh, and I run a program uh, c called the Michigan Translation and Commercialization Program. So we basically go in and look for high-value research at any of the public universities in Michigan, and we can fund uh, through grants uh, that we are provided for through the state toward a commercialization program. So up to a couple hundred thousand dollars just to get the research out to commercialization. But that's not why I'm here. Uh, I'm primarily here because I've been an active angel investor. I'm not an academic by nature. Uh, I've am, I am, am act, been an active angel investor for over 15 years and I'm part of the, uh, uh, the Grand Angels, which is out of the West Michigan, and also have been very active in the, developing the uh, Michigan angel community and the network that's put up there, uh, that we have over 11 angel groups in the state with over 300 and about 400 organized angels, and we invest very heavily in early stage uh, technologies and, and such. But, uh, uh, and we can talk a little bit more about the angel community here. I can also tell you, I, every time I come down here, I'm envious of the ecosystem that's been developed around ag. It's really great. So just like you're probably envious of our basketball team, I think, <laughs> go green. Go Duke. <laughs> So uh, what we want to do for the panel, now that you've got a chance and a flavor of who our panelists are and what they do, is one, invite the audience to stand up at the microphone at any time. If a question comes up on the subject matter, by all means, we will reserve some time at the end if needed, but we would rather have this be interactive. And we're going to do a bit of a speed round across the panel for one more piece, starting with Kevin. In a minute or less, we're going to discuss what does ag tech mean to you and what type of investing do you do? Well, ag tech is, what we see in Michigan is not the same ag tech you see here. We've had one company called Civotech got spun out of Michigan State University. That's a big data yield type of thing, but we do a lot of plant biology. We'd love to see more of these kinds of ideas and more of these growing ideas uh, at Michigan, but we just don't have that kind of ecosystem that's driving it, giving us that type of opportunity. What was the second part? I'm sorry. 
uh, your type of angel investing, a brief discussion of what it means to be an angel investor. Okay, well, it, angel investor, actually, an angel investor is an accredited investor. So for those who don't know it, uh, basically, it's uh, you have to have a million dollars of assets or approximately 250,000 annual income by SEC standards to say, uh, for if you're going to pitch to me, I can say I'm an accredited investor. And so, a matter of fact, I would recommend that you have a much larger portfolio than a million dollars if you want to do angel investing. Um, so what angel investors do, we invest our personal money versus some of these guys are investing corporate money. Uh, we invest our personal money into these startups. Uh, and then also our investments are, there's no time horizon versus a VC firm, which might be on a five year of investment, five year of harvesting. Our investments, we do investing and we sit there until there's an exit strategy around it. And often that is, uh, it used to, we used to think it was going to be five years, then it became seven years, now it's closer to 10 years on many of these assets. And so, uh, personally, I try to manage, I try to keep anywhere between 10 to 15% of my portfolio into these early stage, uh, what I call private equity investments, uh, because it's a, actually a good portfolio strategy. So. And are, are you reserving capital for all follow-on rounds? I mean, that's, yeah. one, that's one issue we see with angel investors is they underestimate the, the, the ticket all the way through to exit. Yeah, actually, it's interesting that it has changed quite a bit in the last few years because uh, we're getting the opportunity now to uh, do more follow-on rounds. I recently did, uh, and actually, I think I really, I really did the investment simply because I wanted to be on the cap table with these guys. So I recently did a Series E round, an investment in a tech company, which was a spin out out of uh, University of Michigan. And I did it because the other people who are on that, on that cap table are Draper Capital, Austin Ventures, which is Michael Dale and some of the other companies. And then, then you get J. Kevin McKern's revocable trust. So, <laughs> it's a, you know, it's like, I, I just, I framed that one and put it up there. Just so, it, but yeah, no, we're getting more opportunities. But as long as my portfolio continues to grow, yep. then the amount of money I invest on a follow-on round do it too. So. And Connie, do you want to tell us a little bit quickly on impact and then what ag tech means to you? Sure. Uh, ag tech, from yield lab perspective, is anything that's going to, and we we say agri food tech, even though it's a mouthful, uh, because it's going to be anything that touches agricultural or food systems, including supply chain logistics, uh, food ingredients, aquaculture really broad strokes. Um, and then we do take everything through an impact lens filter. Um, for us right now, it's binary. Is there a clear, uh, can there be a clear reduction in, uh, in, in pollution? Can there be a reduction in malnutrition? Can there be an increase in farmer income? Um, a whole series of kind of, of uh, areas of impact we'll look at. And right now it's a, you know, if this company is successful, will, this, will there be a direct effect? Um, we're working on refining that. Great. And then David, corporate investing and a little bit of very quickly what ag tech means. Sure. So um, we're investing very broadly uh, in any and everything. So, so we, we define ag tech very, very broadly. So uh, for us, it, it can be, you know, chemical crop protection, traditional seeds, um, anything biological uh, we're very active in. Um, but we're also very active in the digital space. Um, and any, any R&D enabling technology that you can think of, um, so for example, we co-invest with a lot of pharmaceutical companies because a lot of that R&D enabling technology can be applied in, in uh, agricultural sciences as well. So um, very, very broadly, we have three e-marketplace investments in our portfolio, for example. Um, and I'm typically going to uh, FinTech conferences where none of the companies have an ag perspective, but we're looking aggressively for technologies that we can port into agriculture. We'd like to be the first one. In, right? From a corporate investing side, is it typically you're looking for strategic and synergistic fit? Well, so uh, our goal is twofold. Um, Everything into which we invest will have a strategic rationale for Syngenta. So when I go to my investment committee, you know, I have to, have, I have to go with a straight face and say, um, 
This is why strategically it makes sense for Syngenta. That's not to say that we require any kind of collaboration because most of the time we don't have a collaboration when we walk in the door. Um, so we, we do look for a strategic reason, but then the other half of the equation, which is equally important, is a venture capital return, right? Yep. Because without that, without that return discipline, the other side of the equation falls short, we find. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, and Tim, do you mind telling us a little bit, as you look at things, what equals ag tech, and from a venture perspective, how you're looking at the deals? Sure, ag tech is obviously a pretty broad catch-all term, just like in other industries, we see fintech, sports tech, martech. Um, specifically from our lens, we really value the tech portion of it, so it's a tech company first and foremost that just happens to be um, utilizing that technology to solve a problem in agriculture. Uh, we specifically look at software-based businesses, uh, at least 90% of our portfolio is software um, at the core. So uh, that, and, and, and also B2B SaaS enterprise type um, uh, business model. So that limits the range of uh, ag tech uh, subsets that fit our, our investment criteria. But yeah, as a venture investor, we're looking for the typical rule of thumb of like a 10x return in that five to seven year range. We're typically um, one of, if not the first institutional investor. So we usually come right after uh, an angel round or going out uh, through an accelerator. Fantastic. And Corbett, if you'd talk a little bit about ag tech and then what it meant to you and your startups as you were raising financing. Sure, so <clears throat> I'm an electrical engineer by training and uh, probably done more software in my life than anything else. So um, very similar to some of the other answers. I, I look at the world through the lens of software, electronics, wireless uh, communications, uh, et cetera. So that, that's what ag tech uh, means to me. What, um, th the other thing that I find exciting is trying to find solutions in other markets that just for whatever reason have not been uh, you know, brought to agriculture. So in the case of uh, 640, uh, we were trying to take very inexpensive electronics, and Bluetooth technology, uh, mobile devices, and provide a very inexpensive, and as Steve Pitstick would call it, seamless data collection from the field and make it very uh, affordable and approachable for, for growers. In the case of uh, Tillable, uh, trying to take some of the marketplace concepts that have worked in uh, real estate or in FinTech and apply it to, uh, apply to agriculture and to landowners because you know, our thesis is a lot of ag tech has, left, has, has really left behind landowners and landowners haven't really participated in ag tech as much as, um, as much as farmers have so far. Thanks, and so for the i teams in the audience, the reason we went through the various types of investors, angel early, impact, looking for something beyond return, corporate synergistic with return, venture return, and then from a startup perspective, Corbett walking us through what you're thinking about as you're bringing your technologies forward. So I'm gonna kick our first question off uh, to Tim. Tim, you know, we've talked a lot about the trends in ag investing, meaning there's overlap with software, there's overlap with bio, there's a lot of adjacent technologies. Can you talk to us a little bit as you go out and maybe even in your pipeline or look at deals, what's the impact of these adjacent technologies back on ag tech and for you as you make an investment decision? Sure, yeah, we're seeing more and more just overlap uh, across all industries, but, you know, in this case particularly in ag where... Um, <clears throat> since we focus specifically on software, we're, we're getting software companies, but it, I mean, it's becoming rarer and rarer for me to see a pitch deck that doesn't include AI, uh, machine learning, blockchain, um, some of these kind of buzzwords and, and applying them to, uh, to ag tech. So uh, we're, we're seeing it more and more, and um, you know, I, I kind of feel like that's going to be the future as well, as it's just going to be... Um, just a complete overlap where everything involves uh, involves the data play because there is so much uh, data that's currently being captured that's not being utilized as well as data that uh, isn't being captured that can help whether it's growers make more relevant decisions or, or what have you in the various different elements of the value chain. Fantastic. Thank you. And David, I'm going to throw the same question your way. You, you alluded to it in your earlier answer, you're going to fintech conferences, you're seeing this overlap, you're going outside of ag. Why don't you tell us in a quick way of 
how that has influenced some of your investment decisions. And how are you taking maybe the entrepreneurs who don't see themselves in the ag tech space and helping them understand why it's the right fit for them in an area to explore? Sure. So, um, I mean, that. So, I should start by saying I try to stay ahead of the hot, right? So, um, we were investing in satellite imagery six and seven years ago mm -hmm. when our committee looked at us and said, satellites, really? <laughs> right? So, everyone's doing it now. Um, what, what, I, what I see as really hot right now, two spaces, um, FinTech and, but more specifically, um, risk management within FinTech, right? Yep. And that, that is very much the case across Asia Pacific, Europe, Latin America, and the US. We're seeing uh, in the last two years a crop of startups with some really interesting um, approaches to, to risk management where they're attempting to transfer uh, the financial risk of farming to the financial markets. And as a strategic who is selling, you know, high dollar items to growers, I mean, that just makes sense for me if I can help them avoid or manage their risk, um, that improves their business and it, it makes sense for us, right? Fantastic. And um, yeah, I was actually going to throw the next question to Corbett. And it really has to do as our entrepreneur on the panel, when we think about ag ecosystems, 640 Labs was early in sort of an ag ecosystem time, and now you're on your second. Can you talk about, do you think we have developed ag ecosystems? And really more about what you've seen and how they've developed over the time you've been involved as an entrepreneur in the space. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really changed. So, I mean, I'll, I'll throw a couple of examples out there. So, the, although I'm no longer at Climate, I think Climate has built a pretty a pretty strong platform for other companies to tie into through APIs, et cetera, and give an avenue to market um, that, you know, perhaps didn't exist in the past where um, they can plug into an existing platform. Um, so that, that's an ecosystem uh, of sorts. But it, it's just, I, I remember when I was uh, originally pitching VCs in 2013 or so, uh, there was a, there just wasn't the uh, awareness that uh, ag tech could have uh, such a big impact on agriculture. And there, there have been a number of, you know, large exits, you know, you know climate, uh, granular, and others that I think have really opened up the eyes of the VC investors. So uh, the investors play a huge role in the ecosystem. Uh, without the investors, uh, very similar to without the landowners, um, ag tech doesn't work without the investors. So it's... The ecosystem of investors is way better today. Fantastic. Thanks. And Connie, I know Yield Lab's been deeply involved in sort of an ag ecosystem, building it not only in the Midwest, but globally. Do you want to talk a little bit about what you've seen recently in the space? Yeah, sure. Thanks. And, and I think the, the kind of digital infrastructure ecosystem is a super interesting in of its own to be that API integration component and in the kind of what I would call like a cloud ecosystem almost is is a really interesting space to watch develop. The way we're thinking about it is really more um, from a connectivity of stakeholders to ag tech, right? Um, and really looking almost in a kind of economic, it, it, truly in an economic development sense. Um, so I think you hear a lot from different kind of economic development groups in different regions that say we're, we're the hub of this thing and we're, you know, there's a lot of that going on. Um, and I think uh, because we're so global, um, something that we've noticed that is really appealing to company, companies want to work with us because we've got this global network. And within the Yield Lab, we can connect, you know, the companies that we're invested in, we can connect to things. Um, we're limited in our capacity on the fund side to do more than that. Um, on the institute side, however, we're, we're not limited and, and we'd like to extend that network because we think that ag tech right now is kind of in a space where there actually needs to be a greater diversity of deal flow. I think it's great they're going to the fintech conferences because I think that we need to get more of those folks working in this space, but you can't just have what I call the, the tech bro fixing the farm phenomenon. We can't just have that. So <laughs> you, you, you have to also integrate the landowners and the farmers. 
Um, so what we're doing is creating a new economic development model, really a framework for what is an ag tech ecosystem. We've, we've already actually assessed St. Louis through this lens and we'll publish a white paper in the next week or two on that. Um, and we're doing the same in Rosario, Argentina and Piracicaba, Brazil, um, and in the process of setting up a few other projects. But essentially what we're trying to do is um, create the framework for what, in, in incorporating public policy, incorporating infrastructure, incorporate, and infrastructure includes farms and exports, which I think is a really important thing to note, um, and incorporating financial capital and in incorporating human capital, and then the interconnectivity between those. And we're doing that initially on kind of a local regional level, um, but then we're, we're, we're starting to, ultimately the vision here is to be able to create these on a global level. Um, in the same way that we're able to do with our limited number of teams to affect the limited number of portfolio companies we have on the fund side, we would like for there to be a lot more collaboration, um, again, on all of these kind of, on a regional and then international level uh, between the different kind of ag tech hubs because we are kind of driving thesis here is there's not going to be a Silicon Valley of ag tech necessarily in the way that there, there can be for kind of software because geography just plays such a substantial role um, in, in what kind of technologies apply where. Um, so we think that it's really important that we, we think about that and integrate that into uh, kind of the way that different businesses in different areas are, are interacting. Fantastic. I, just, I, oh, uh, I, yeah. I want to compliment the Yield Lab. So Absolutely. Uh, in uh, July and November, I was in your offices in Piracicaba, Brazil, and in uh, Buenos Aires, mm -hmm. and it's fantastic setup. Um, great teams, and um, uh, the guys in Buenos Aires laid a map in front of me with uh, 450 startup companies in ag tech that Yield Lab is touching uh, across Latin America. So I mean really an excellent uh, operation and, and a broad reach. Thank you. And we're co-investors too, right? Yeah, we, we, are, yeah. we are, yeah. Fair to say that Yield Labs is helping build the ecosystem mm -hmm. and it's been, uh, we're co-invested as well and it really has helped build an ag ecosystem. I, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and go to Kevin. And Kevin, you know, in our pre-conversation, you talked a lot about the activity of angel investing in Michigan, what's occurring. What I was hoping you might talk with us about today is what are you seeing in angel investing in Michigan? And then very specifically, what are the ag tech and the ag deals that you're seeing? How do you see them growing and where you see it maybe now versus five years from now? Yeah, well, that's a great question. So I'm glad that you developed that question. So get going. But anyhow, um, this is, I'm gonna give you some numbers from uh, 2017. We have, like I said, 11 angel groups in the state and we have this Michigan Angel Network um, that we collect data not only from the companies that we invest in, but from the investors and such and such. And this is, we don't have the numbers for the 2018, but um, this is uh, from 2017. So in 2017, there was approximately $42 million spent on early stage companies by angels in the angel groups. About 400 of those angels are in the organized, 11 organized groups, another, um, you know, a couple hundred are in, um, are, are standalones. Uh, and uh, the, the additional amount of money that came through to these early stage companies uh, totaled up to 106,000. So, uh, and in fact, if you look historically, angels uh, will invest in about three companies, three to four companies, and then about two of those companies will end up becoming a VC company. So they're the feeder system for the VC systems. And so, you know, that's why Michigan's done a, has been very active in trying to develop angel groups because they're the early part of the ecosystem associated with it. Um, so uh, of those, there were 70 companies that we invested in in 2017. And um, just to kind of give you an idea of the economy of Michigan, so auto is always sort of the leading economy. Uh, then, then ag and life sciences kind of bounce back and forth between two or three and as to who's the leading, uh, the leading parts of the economy. Uh, and if you look at where the angel and early stage VC money goes into the, into the state, um, uh, the most of the companies that we invested in, I think it was, um, uh, about 30 of them were tech companies, 
of all kinds of things. A lot of that comes out of Ann Arbor, other places too. We have some in, in the west side of Michigan. Uh, but 19 of them were life science companies. And of the life science, about 16, about 17 million went into life sciences. About 15 million went into, of the angel money went into uh, the tech companies. So the question I have for you, since ag is like the second or third largest um, economy in the state, how much do you think went into ag in 2017? Anybody want to guess? Give me a number. A million or, or less? Over a million? Anybody want to guess? Yeah. You think it was over a million? It was less than $100,000. Yeah. Third largest economy, maybe second largest economy, and only 100000 went into ag or animal sciences. And that's, that's equity investment? Yeah, mainly. Well, it usually goes in as convertible debt or preferred yep. you'd have any, but equity investment. Yep. And the reason is, is that basically we don't see any ag deals. I can give you uh, on my hand the number of companies that we get to see on ag. Uh, Vesteron, which Vesteron. you all might know about that one. But by the way, that didn't come out of Michigan. That came out of licensed technology from University of Connecticut. Uh, we also had uh, farm logs, which came out of University of Michigan. That was one of our companies. Uh, Native traits, which probably most people know about. It's a little bit smaller. Um, uh, Cebo Tech, which came out of University of Michigan State University, but it went straight to the VC community. Uh, and uh, it was like, you never see that kind of thing happening out of a university where it goes straight to the VC, but it was a $30 million round on its first round. And then we've got a, another company called Tillerman Seeds. There might still be a few other ones, but the point is, is that we don't even get to see the deals because they're not coming to us and we don't even have the ecosystem that's driving them. That's why what you got here is so important and what you have in St. Louis is so important is because it's driving the deals, it's creating the talent, it's creating, you know, to, to invest in ag, we, we all know how to invest in life sciences, by the way. I can tell you, I can write my own, I can write a development plan on how to take a drug to market, I can take a medical device to market, but most of our investors, so if I ask you, you know, uh, how you take a seed or any kind of ag, uh, project to any any product to to the market, uh, we don't have an idea. So we have to do a better job of it, teaching our investors how to invest in ag. But we also have to have uh, our we have to have the management pool and the talent, and we also have to have the new companies coming to us. So, you know, um, by the way, we do stretch out. We have actually have money in a University of Illinois, a company called Reconstruct. Yes. We're co-investors in Reconstruction. Yes, and they are raising another round. So we do go beyond uh, Michigan, but we're looking for good deals that are within the region. So, and we co-invest with Hyde Park Angels. We co-invest with, with the um, Irish Angels, too. Fantastic. It's actually a great segue, Tim, because I've got a question for you. And as we start thinking about um, management teams and teams, so you know, at an angel investing level, sometimes we'll take a little risk without a fully built-out team. But at a venture level, it usually seems that people are talking about team, team, team when helping make a decision. Can you walk us through where you're seeing the leaders of ag tech coming from and some of these ag tech software companies you're looking at and talking to and kind of the crossover? And then, Corbin, I'm going to switch it back to you after Tim because your background was a little unique and maybe you could talk about how the venture community took that when you talked to them. So, Tim, if you don't mind starting for us on that. Yeah, absolutely. And to emphasize that point uh, of the different pieces of criteria, the market team, team is number one for us. So w without a strong team in place, um, it's pretty much a deal killer for us. Um, my information may be a little bit skewed because uh, I'm based here in Champaign. So it, it seems like the, the ag deals that come across my desk, a majority are coming out of academia. So it's um, uh, teams that are coming out of universities, not just here in Champaign, but, but elsewhere as well. So that would be the number one spot um, number two would be just tech entrepreneurs that are applying um, uh, technology to <clears throat> agriculture. One area that I don't see that much of, and it would be interesting to see um, some of others on the panel that have a little more experience looking at just ag deals, but um, 
that I see in a lot of other industries is, is folks coming out of industries. So working at um, corporations in agriculture, identifying a problem, building a team around solving that problem. That, that's a profile of founder that we really like. And um, just, just for whatever reason, I haven't seen very many of that um, in, in ag. That's fantastic. And that's fun. I was just couldn't not answer that because that's almost exclusively what we funded. Um, yeah, we call it, we, we sometimes call, we're right, our office is right across the street from Monsanto and St. Louis, or Bayer now, but we call it Monsanto University frequently because so many of our founders and even our, our general partners um, are, are coming out of there. And it's, it's, I mean, when you get these big acquisitions that happen, so like, you know, Anheuser-Busch is in St. Louis, they were acquired a couple years ago, that resulted in a bunch of, now we've got a ton of breweries around town. Um, when uh, uh, the, with the Pfizer acquisition, so, so these acquisitions actually spin out a lot of really interesting founding teams. Um, so just to chime that in there. Fantastic, so appreciate it. Did, Corbett, why don't you talk a little bit about when you spoke with venture groups and you being a part of the team as a founder and that, how did it go? What were those conversations like? Well, the, just to give a little bit of context, so I did not grow up on a farm. I don't have an agriculture background. Uh, I got uh, pulled into this, I guess I would say, by uh, my co-founder at uh, 640 Labs, uh, Craig Rupp. So Craig grew up on a farm, uh, used to work at John Deere. He and I worked together at Motorola. And um, the way that conversation went was, he's like, hey, you know, farmers are some of the best customers in the world. There's a lot of opportunity to uh, improve productivity. And that, that's kind of what started me uh, down this uh, journey. When, um, so at 640, when we were talking to uh, investors, uh, Craig played the role of the farm boy, and uh, I guess I played the role of the, of the business guy. Um, for Tillable, it was a little, little bit different. Uh, Craig is off doing another startup, startup and uh, it's really uh, myself and one other person uh, who started 640. But I had the experience of uh, building 640, getting acquired by Climate, uh, the experience that I had uh, with climate and Monsanto. So it, um, the second time it was dramatically easier. I mean, obviously, uh, I don't know if it necessarily should have been easier, but it, it was, uh, you know, just because of the experience that I gained over the last few years. I, I would encourage, uh, it, and what I think needs to happen in ag tech is uh, to pull more people from outside of agriculture into it uh, to provide, you know, more diversity of thought. I, I've been told a lot of times, well, Corbett, you just don't understand. Farmers just won't do X, Y, Z. And um, I, what I'm proposing is we need more uh, disruptive thinking and less uh, incremental thinking. And I think by getting more people and more diverse thought, you know, around the table as we're starting these companies, um, it, can, it can really energize the team and come up with, you know, brand new ideas that, yeah, what I'm doing at Tillable may be impossible. I'm too, too stupid to know it, uh, but I'm going to really try, you know, my best to make it happen. So I think it's, it's really diversity of thought. And don't just think about the kid that grew up on a farm or some guy that, that works at Syngenta. Uh, a lot of people are capable of starting ag tech uh, companies. So can I be provocative? It, absolutely. I'm going to push back on that, right? So we, I think we have seen over the last five years or so an awful lot of companies get funded at valuations that are inflated uh, with entrepreneur teams who don't have an ag background who came to ag from somewhere else. And it really shows in the business model that they've selected. And we're seeing a lot of those business models not get traction, right? So, I mean, the, I, I really do appreciate the idea of um, fresh thought and new perspectives. Completely agree with that. But I think you, you really have to ground it um, in, in the market, right? Because we, we see an awful lot of business models come out of Silicon Valley, where we get tech guys who have had a successful software XYZ company <clears throat> who, who think, wow, I, I can 
repurpose this and do it in ag. And they come to ag and they're coming to pitch us and we look at the business model and or they've had a series A, they've had a series B, they've had a series C, the valuation's super high, they've got no traction whatsoever. And it's because the business model is a complete mismatch for the ag economy. So it just needs to be grounded in realism. Yeah, and, and uh, so I don't disagree with that. You know, I'm not from California, I'm from Chicago, so I've got farms in my backyard. But uh, uh, I, I don't disagree with that, but I, I would also say um, we need more failure, honestly. I not think my portfolio. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to stop this. I just want to remind everyone, we're down to 15 minutes. You've got an active group. Come on up to the microphones. Keep going. It looked like Connie. Well, so, yeah, so well, 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 I'm going to moderate. I'm going to moderate. I'm going to moderate. So, no, no, no. You're, you're, you, you can have both, though, right? Because you do need to have more disruptive ideas, but you can't, again, have the, the tech row fixing farming phenomenon. Um, so you need to have that person working with the right people. Which is why, you know, that's why the Yield Lab Accelerator works because we can help those people who don't have experience if they're coachable and if they're willing to work with us and understand, okay, well, you've got this really cool disruptive idea. This, this could work, but you need to understand that that farmer isn't going to buy that. It's not going to work in this market. You need to understand you have to be able to service your actual customers and therefore you can't do that from Silicon Valley necessarily. Um, there's, there's a whole bunch of components there. And then I have one other thing that that I think ties really well into this, that I, I find myself bringing up on every panel, and I'll have to keep doing it, I guess. But I also think that when we look at what founding teams in ag tech are gonna be, they're gonna be more diverse, not just in terms of skill sets and backgrounds, but uh, you know, looking at people too. I think that you can't not bring up the, the gender disparity um, and the underrepresented founder kind of disparity that exists, and it's actually more prominent in ag tech than in some other investment spaces. Um, female founders don't get funded for the most part. So I, I, I think that that presents kind of, to me, that that is an opportunity for an investor. Um, and I also think that it's an opportunity for making sure that you can have that kind of collaboration that enables disruption and also uh, groundedness in the reality of the industry. Yeah, and I, I was specifically uh, using the word diversity in a very broad sense. And I, I agree 100%. There's, uh, we need... Uh, we need gender diversity, uh, racial diversity uh, on these teams. Uh, I'm doing my best uh, with my leadership team at Tillable, but uh, I, I always joke around. I don't want to sit around in a room with a bunch of other, you know, fat old white guys, right? I mean, I want, I want real diversity on the team uh, to help. And just to go back on the, the startup thing, I, I, honestly, I think we do... We need more nonlinear thinking, more, um, more people that are willing to fail. I think we're too critical of ag tech companies that fail. I, I think we need to embrace failure and, uh, and move quickly uh, like the rest of the technology industry. I'm going to throw it off to our audience. We have a question in the audience. Yes, uh, the, the, the room just came alive when David just pushed back. It is really amazing what you were talking. It resonated with me. My name is Gopal Nadkarni, and I'm a University of Akron professor. And two years ago, I started an ag tech venture in Bengaluru, India, to serve a growing need in that market. I am, as a mechanical uh, engineer with a manufacturing background, I like to be disruptive. I'm the crazy guy in the team. But I teamed up with two Monsanto people who are much more grounded in reality. So I wanted to start up a hydroponic farm with sensors and all sorts of machine, you know, machine learning and all that. And my Monsanto people said, no, let's just have a proof of concept first before we get to the next stage. It's been two years now, we're operationally profitable. And my question is, uh, both to David, as well as to the rest of the panel, I mean, India is becoming rapidly urbanized. In three decades, we're gonna have 50% of the population, 600 million people going to the urban areas. What do you see as a panel, as a future for ag tech, or maybe it's just ag urban, in the future of other countries, not just United States and Canada, where population and the demographics is exploding and their opportunities abound, where do you see the future of ag tech going in these places? And I would love to connect with other entrepreneurs in this space as well. Sure, so um, the most 
recent investment we closed in December was Ninja Cart, oh, yeah. which is an e marketplace in N India. Nandans, Nandan, Nilikens. Yeah, it's, and it, uh, we love the investment. So we're, we're seeing maybe 100 deals a year out of India, um, and we send people regularly. Um, and so my, my thinking about uh, emerging markets, developing markets in general, is that um, absolutely any way you look, there's an opportunity to make money and to apply technology <coughs> to address that gap in, in productivity and yield. I mean, there's just, I mean, there's a ton of opportunities. And, um, so in Latin America, for example, in Brazil and Argentina in particular, we, we've seen an absolute uh, spike in investment activity over the last three years or so, which is why Yield Lab opened up in both Buenos Aires and Sao Paulo. Um, and gosh, there was a billion dollars in venture capital deployed in ag tech um, or ag food tech in Latin America last year. Um, India is on that same trajectory, um, but just a little bit farther behind the curve because the, the ag economy in India is much more smallholder mm -hmm. uh, versus Latin America where it's large commercial growers um, that dominate. And that's kind of more attractive from an investment perspective. <clears throat> but they're just, we're seeing you know, five years ago when I was making, when I was looking around Latin America, India, Australia uh, for investments, I was seeing a lot of Me Too stuff. Um, that was, you know, people looking at uh, the U.S., what are you doing there? And then taking that idea and taking it to Brazil, right? Now what I'm seeing, totally different, completely new innovation, right? Brand new ideas coming out of Brazil, India, Mexico, um, China, and we're actually now seeing some of those ideas come back to the US, right? So it's really exciting time in emerging and developed markets. And there are a lot of capital inflows, right? So a lot of brand name funds in the US um, in their new funds are um, adding to their charter to enable ex-US investment, which is a big deal. Right? Mm -hmm. Un unnoticed, but it's a big deal. Thank you. Thanks. We've got time for one more audience question. If anyone has an additional question. Yes. I was wondering, uh, how do you see ag tech um, impacting some of these uh, other areas of our food system? So say uh, enabling uh, more beginning farmers, um, some local regional food systems, things like urban farming, some of these other areas of the food system, uh, increasing equity, things like this. Is, is there a role that ag tech can play in kind of growing those efforts? I'm happy to take this. I think I always, so I came into this space kind of through the food computer, open ag, indoor farming, urban kind of space. But also my family has a soy corn operation in Iowa, so I have kind of foot in both worlds, I guess. Um, and I think that I always make it say there's the urban ag community and the big ag community and like best case scenario We're not throwing things at each other and Like that's stupid because we really all want the same thing at the end of the day Which is to make sure that everyone has access to healthy food at, a, at an affordable price, right? And not to do so at the detriment of the environment so I think that again, you know when I look at ag tech I'm including food tech and I'm including urban systems I think that we'll see, continue to see controlled environment ag, and I specifically use that instead of vertical farming, but I think we'll continue to see controlled environment ag take off. Um, and I think that when you can, and, and I know that when you can produce food more efficiently with lower inputs, you greatly, in, you reduce the price of food and therefore can increase the availability of food. So there's kind of two components to urban ag in my mind, you know, there's, sure, producing in an urban environment, which I think is generally not necessarily the most profitable, the most effective way to do things. I think that you see a lot, you will see a lot more peripheral, uh, peripheral kind of production. So you look at um, semi-urban kind of production, um, which enables some level of local food systems. 
Um, but, but all of that falls into the realm of ag tech. It just needs to make sense. The one challenge can be from a venture capital and, and you know, the type of investments really all of us are making, we're not gonna invest in really infrastructure heavy projects. Um, and so that can become kind of challenging, but certainly the technology to support that when it's, as it starts to, it, we're at a really early stage, but as it starts to kick off, that's, we're interested. Yeah, we're, uh, so the US is well behind Europe in controlled environment, CEA, mm -hmm. controlled environment ag, and it's growing at, you know, plus 40% annually in the US right now. So there are actually, um, venture and private equity funds that are being launched solely to do investment in protected ag. And I'm not including um, vertical farming. And, and you may not like when I say this, but vertical farming is like this big. I mean, it's just another kind of farming and actually we think less profitable than regular farming. So yeah. <laughs> I'm not a fan of vertical farming and, I'm, and that is not part of the big growth in CEA. And I'll close this. And since uh, Michigan just passed cannabis uh, legally for recreational purposes, we're going to be growing a lot more stuff indoors up there now. So, and by the way, it's only two hours up to the border, so we'll see all you Illinoisans up there. So. Well, then, I, what I'd like to do is ask the audience to take a minute and thank our esteemed panelists for taking the time, sharing their insights.